it's a horrible situation in the entire city of Jackson. No water to drink. We can't drink it. I'm not able to cook like I want to cook. We can't brush our teeth with it. I honestly don't even want to bathe my baby in Jackson's water. It's not normal. This is not the first time this has happened. I believe racism plays a big uh, part in that. So it came to a boiling point, and you see where we are now. But it's good that the federal government's finally getting involved in it, and they're going to fix it. The Ross Barnett Reservoir in Jackson is supposed to supply the state capital of Mississippi with water. But at the end of August, after a spell of flooding, there was a pump failure and there was no water at all for a whole week. The Army and Federal Rescue Services intervened and millions of water bottles were distributed to the 150,000 people affected. And so we must continue to elevate our voices and say that the residents of Jackson are worthy. They are worthy of a dependable system. And we look forward to a coalition of the willing that will join us in the fight to improve this system that has been failing for decades. Today, some seven days later, I'm very happy to report that we have returned water pressure to the city. There may be more bad days in the future. We have, however, reached a place where people in Jackson can trust that water will come out of the faucet. People in Jackson can trust that toilets can be flushed, and people in Jackson can trust that the fires can be fought. The water system collapsed because the city can no longer afford to maintain it. There are no longer any taxes coming in. Jackson has lost a quarter of its population since the 1980s. Dropping from 200,000 to 150,000 inhabitants, thousands of homes have been abandoned and businesses closed. Two months after the crisis, the city has running water again, but it remains undrinkable. The people of Jackson, 80% of whom are black, are exhausted. People are fed up, and they, 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 they just, you know how important it is to have water in your house that are clean. People they don't understand why it's been going on so long, and, and no, they ain't done nothing about it. What turn it might take, I don't what the people might do at a lower level. It's got to stop. It's got to stop now. This after-school center still relies on a machine to filter and purify its water. The district of West Jackson, with its 30,000 inhabitants, has borne the brunt of the issue. 27-year-old Eli understands full well the gravity of the situation. I've been boiling water since I was a kid. <laughs> like, yes. We've been boiling water forever. Oh, I mean, it's always been rough. You know, uh, like, Jackson has a negative connotation to it um, because of, like, the, you know, the crime rate, you know, and all the things that contribute to that, you know, we all know. People definitely need, to, are gonna, it's gonna get to a breaking point uh, where people are just gonna be fed up and tired and just angry. And yeah, you know, the unspeakable is gonna, be, is gonna happen, you know, so. There's a lot of reasons to make a revolution. Eli works at Cooperation Jackson, a neighborhood association in one of the few places in West Jackson that is still inhabited. The association is known for its left-wing ideology and is close to the Black Lives Matter movement. Joshua is the director. Well, just um, for security reasons, and, um, and then um, I just want to yeah, protect what we have. Um, yeah, um, pardon me. Come on in. Disarm system in 20 seconds. System is now disarmed. Cooperation Jackson is um, a multitude of things, but um, set um, in um, the spirit of 
uh, the New African People's Organization um, in order to democratize the economy um, and give um, uh, more um, economic prowess to um, black people relying on their self-determination. A substantial amount of time to actually help people on the ground. Uh, so our organization, along with several of our allies throughout the Gulf Coast, started mobilizing over the weekend to start gathering on resources. I do think that the water crisis calls upon those contradictions of, one, how does the, the state exist, and then how does the state care and undergird the people that live there. I think that there is a growing popularization of the left, um, but that's that's a popularization in theory, that's a popularization in in name. But I think that the project, like that, is Cooperation Jackson. I think that the projects across the municipality in Jackson, but also um, that are nationally national, I think that they fortify the left and bring in more opportunities for people to come into the left and understand it. Bonjour, bienvenue to Campbell's Bakery, Fondren, Mississippi. Fondren is one of the few districts that's still hanging on. Restaurants have taken to stocking mineral water. Some entrepreneurs still believe they can make it work, like Arden Barnett, a concert and festival organizer. To have a city that is uh, not firing on all cylinders, if you would say, that it is disheartening and also because our young people are not staying in town, they're leaving. And, you know, I've got employees that are that are ready to move because they don't want to live in Jackson anymore. If everyone starts bailing, then, you know, this will be a ghost town. Some of them could afford to live elsewhere, but they choose to stay. One of the places they meet is Urban Fox's Cafe. On Saturday mornings, they host a designer market and serve organic espresso and vegan cakes. Left-wingers Mary, Adeline and William like this place, but admit that it's not very diverse. There are only white people here. They would like to see more people of different backgrounds. What I would like to see uh, is money, the money that's being funneled into the city being funneled in more appropriate ways um, and to benefit other parts of the city. Like here in this nice neighborhood that we're in now, Bellhaven, there's lots of renovations, lots of new stuff popping up and the city estate helped fund a lot of that. Um, and it's great and I love it, but it's not as necessary as all the houses that are falling apart in that part of the city. I feel like we have to fight for ourselves together because we're not going to get assistance from the state to fix these issues like the roads, the water. Um, I feel like it's only going to come from Jackson residents themselves. Let's uh, drive around Jackson a little bit. I can show you a little bit more of the city so you can kind of get a feel of the, the difference between where we were just at and where a lot of people live. Yeah. William is a young immigration lawyer. He's taking us out in the old pickup he inherited from his grandfather. Oh, boy. First stop, the capital, the Republican-held seat of the state of Mississippi. So there's no doubt in my mind that the Republicans would love to move the capital somewhere else. Um, because a lot of these white legislators hate coming to this city. They'd love to pull all of the money out and make their decisions somewhere else in more of a white community because they don't like to come here and see what they've done because three streets over from here from the Capitol building, we can look at some places, some houses that don't have doors on them, you know, and they have to see that. They're faced with that every time they come here. Everybody here is fighting to survive every single day. As somebody who is a leftist and has the capabilities to do it, we need to take that fight to the people that can make the decisions that, that impact people's lives that live here. You know, in order to, to fight for people who cannot effectively fight for themselves because they're stuck in these neighborhoods. The city's abandoned, man. This is one of the areas that was affected the most from the lack of water pressure. It's a symbol of a white majority state withholding funding from an 80% black city. And 
they know exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it. There's, you can make no mistake about it. You know, that it, it's kind of just a, a boiling to the surface of years of neglect and underfunding that was purposeful. You know, they, they want this city to fail. So it's just, uh, it's just another, another symbol of the white supremacy, without a doubt. Jackson is a city with a long history of racial tensions. William was keen to take us to the home of Medgar Evers, a civil rights activist who was murdered by the Ku Klux Klan in 1963. The water pressure is back and residents are able to water their gardens again. We know why this happened. We know why the state is not giving money to Jackson, Mississippi. And I'm an educator here in the state. Yeah. have been for 26 years. And to see things underfunded, even education and yeah. infrastructure and things like that, it's, yeah. it's bad. Things that need the most attention don't get it. That there's no particular hope in any single political party coming to help us. National politics is not on a lot of people's minds here because people are trying to survive every single day. A far cry from the image of Tom Sawyer on the banks of the Mississippi, the state is now one of the poorest in the country. Entire towns have been abandoned. The scars of the Civil War live on, and many view the South as the land of slavery. Mississippi politics is more divisive than ever. Voter turnout is low among black people. And white voters typically vote Republican. I love Mississippi. Je, uh, Enfin, j'habitais Paris quand j'étais plus jeune. J'ai choisi habiter ici à Jackson parce que c'est chez moi. Je veux être ici. Mais euh, la plupart des gens quand ils pensent de Mississippi, ils n'ont pas des images très agréables de l'État. Et ils pensent à, à des problèmes dans notre histoire. Et quand il y a des choses comme ça, pour moi, c'est un désastre euh, d'image aussi. The Republicans accuse the Democrats in charge of City Hall of incompetence. This water crisis is a testament to how polarized politics has become. You used to have moderate Republicans or even liberal Republicans. You used to have moderate Democrats or, or even center-right uh, Democrats. But by and large, I don't think that's something you really see much more. Now, you, there are people on various degrees of the spectrum, and I'm a, a conservative Republican, so I prefer us having conservative Republicans. But I, but I don't think there is nearly as much tolerance of uh, people who are, who are more moderate. I think that's been a change that's occurred over the course of the last 20 or 30 years in the country. All eyes are on the municipality and its charismatic mayor, Democrat Chokwi Lumumba. Tonight, he's at the head of a motorcade. Once a year, the mayor tours the neighborhoods of Jackson and his trip does not go unnoticed to say the least. The first stop is a high school campus where people hug and congratulate each other. In this mainly black area, there's a sense of community and local police are keen to show that they stand with residents. Uh, like we've seen civil unrest all across America, and I thank God and knock on wood that we didn't have the problems that most city had. And I believe that that is because 
of our very intimate relationship by knowing the community and loving the community that we serve. And we're here anytime you need us. So God bless you and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Mayor Chucky Lumumba, who describes himself as the most left-wing mayor in the U.S., says he's not solely responsible for the water crisis. The water crisis uh, further exemplifies why we have to uh, be as, as uh, progressive and as radical as we need to be. Uh, because any time uh, residents are faced with challenges like this, which are envi environmental justice challenges, uh, we have to be willing to take that on at all costs, uh, take a by any means necessary approach to make sure that we secure the resources that people so desperately need and deserve. More to the left. I think it is more to the left. I, I think that, that continuing to agree uh, to a lack of investment, continuing to agree to marginalize people, leave them in the position that we find Jackson residents and, and so many communities across the nation. Businesses in the city center are in decline. The latest victim is Babalu, a restaurant struggling to recruit staff and hard hit by the water crisis. Jeff Good's Bakery and Cafe has lost 20% of its turnover in recent months. Good says things are harder now than they were even during COVID, when businesses had government help. His friends are pushing him to run for mayor. Like the incumbent mayor, he's a Democrat, but he presents himself as a moderate who fears that the water crisis will be fodder for political extremists. I think the narrative that a, a poor black city that doesn't have water uh, plays very, very well into a um, far left, uh, you know, socialist, uh, this, is, this is what happens when uh, people don't have control of government and, and private interests or powerful interests have, have, have control. Um, um, racism enters the conversation. And so I can see at a national level that our story, and I think this is why we've had so many folks like you come in to, to be curious about this and want to talk. I think at the national level that there's a lot of interest in how this problem can be used to advance a, a narrative and an agenda. Only two households in the ultra-chic neighborhood of Woodland Circle are black. Jonathan Lee decided to retire from politics to go into business, and it seems to be paying off for him. I live here not because I don't have choices, but because I'm not leaving the city. I'm dedicated to being part of uh, a renaissance for, for this area. So that's why I make my home here. A member of the Democratic Party Lee ran for mayor, but lost to another Democrat. Now he is seeing some ideas from the left making their way to the White House. If you want to talk politics, I've got to have bourbon. Has there been an awakening? Yes. Uh, their extremes are far more extreme than they once were. Um, the, the, I think the fact that Bernie Sanders was a, was a, a candidate that was probably uh, in the top three or four uh, is unthinkable. You know, so I don't, I don't know that we, we would use the word socialism in this country. Um, I, I think socialism is a bit of a taboo word. Now, it's still a bad word, but when, when, there are, when there are attributes of that socialism that register with me, when it's my daughter that has thousands of dollars uh, in student loan debt, then, okay, this is something I can live with. Can you call it socialism? Absolutely. I don't think they would, though. In the run-up to the midterm elections, Joe Biden decided to cancel some student debt. But self-styled American socialists dismissed this as an empty gesture. Even in the South, activists are open about their affinity to Marxism. Margaret and Will have always found the work of Karl Marx relevant, particularly in the US. When we were reading this with the chapter, we talked a lot about like, how capitalism and how Marx talks about capitalism kind of just really trying to find, like, squeeze out the, um, like, find the margins that it can squeeze out mm. of, like, 
you know, people working longer and longer hours, um, like at, at what, until people hit their breaking points, um, and it gets as close up to that line as you can to make as much money as you can. Yeah, and, and I think like the recent, you know, uh, increase in unionization efforts uh, really demonstrate that uh, uh, as people understand the power of their labor and also come to the point where they can't take being exploited any longer, they start to organize to, uh, uh, you know, actually do something about it. Uh, and that's what's happening in Amazon uh, shops across the country. That's what's happening at Starbucks. Marx can explain a lot of what's going on, and a lot more than I think a lot of people people realize. The deep political divisions in the country raised the prospect of armed revolt, which until recently would have been unthinkable. When William and Will founded the local chapter of the Democratic Socialist Party two years ago, the pandemic, water crisis, and the capital riots hadn't happened yet. No, sure, sure. Yeah. They understand the scope of the challenges, but also see their arguments gaining traction. It's, it's rough out there. I got it's two, the 17 character string. You know, America is a violent society. It always has been. But I don't think much has changed in the mentality of Americans. I think people are just a little bit more open about their violent tendencies. Things are kind of coming to a head. I don't know if, like, individuals are getting more violent as much as, like, the state is cracking down on people. But, um, uh, Certainly, I think, you know, as somebody who grew up in, like, the Bush administration, talking about socialist ideals is a lot more uh, acceptable than it was, you know, 20 years ago, let alone 30 years ago, um, for sure. Mary Adeline, who we met on the cafe terrace, had joined the Democrats after Donald Trump's 2016 election win but she's now disillusioned with Joe Biden. She is no longer a party activist, but her heart remains on the left. For want of anything better, she will vote for a Democratic candidate, but mostly to block the Republicans. I do feel orphaned. I feel like there were, there's two major camps of politics in the US, um, and the Democrats were supposed to be um, the party of the people and who cared about the poor and who cared about the subjected. Um, but the older I get and the more you know, involved I get or more of a better view that I get, um, they just seem as part of the establishment, all kind of in it for their own good. Um, but then there's the actual leftist people who come up, um, who come up in political campaigns, uh, but the support for them seems to be so low um, that it's hard to throw my support behind them when I would rather still have a Democrat than a Republican be elected. So I still throw my support behind Democrats um, because the actual leftists just don't seem as viable a candidate. <laughs> I want to stay here. I want to stay here and try to make it better. Whether socialist or conservative, Democrat or Republican, everyone in Jackson who can afford it is asking the same question leave to live in a city that isn't falling apart, or stay because they still have faith in their system, and because they still believe in the future of the place they call home.